Thank you all for coming. I love sharing my mother's story, so it's really nice to be able to share it with all of you. Um, so in 2002, after both of my parents had passed away, uh, we found these amazing handwritten diaries that my mother had written during the Holocaust from age 13 until about 20. Mm -hmm. They're written in beautiful, old-fashioned German that, from what I understand, today's Germans can't even read. It's an old-fashioned version of German. And um, I will talk about the diaries a little later, but I just want to start by giving you an overview of my parents, of my mother's experiences, of her family's experiences. So my mother was born, Erika Lobel, in the town of Bamberg, Germany, which is in Bavaria, in the south of Germany. It's a picture book medieval German town. It looks literally like out of a fairy tale. I've had the good fortune to have gone there several times, and it's just really like out of a German fairy tale. And from everything I know, my mother had a very idyllic life there, a very happy childhood, um, and lived very comfortably. Um, they were a middle-class Jewish, Jewish family with a very comfortable life. And all of that changed in November 1938. November 10th, 1938 was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Uh, the Nazis um, ransacked Jewish-owned businesses, uh, destroyed synagogues, Jewish schools, Jewish cemeteries, arrested Jewish men. And in the town of Bamberg, where my mother and her family lived, they burned down the synagogue and they arrested all the Jewish men in town, including my mother's father, my grandfather. So my grandfather was taken to the Dachau concentration camp. At this point, this was 1938, they were still letting people go. Um, they weren't keeping them at the concentration camps. They brought them to basically scare them into leaving the country. So my grandfather was at Dachau for three weeks and they told him, we'll let you go, but next time you won't be so lucky. So uh, if you know what's good for you, you better leave the country. Um, because if you're arrested again, you won't get released. So needless to say, my mother's parents began a frantic search for a way to get out of Germany. Um, unfortunately, at that time, the United States had very strict immigration rules and really did not do much to open their doors to European Jews. So they tried to get into the United States, and that didn't work. They tried to get into Cuba and other Latin American countries, I think Italy. And time after time, it just failed. They weren't able to find a way out of the country. So my mother's parents made the very painful decision to split the family up. And uh, there was something called the Kinder Transport, which was an operation run out of the United Kingdom where they rescued Jewish children from Nazi-occupied countries all over Europe and brought them to the United Kingdom. So um, my mother's parents decided to send my mother, Erica, and her brother, Werner, um, through the kinder transport to England. And you can imagine what it must have been like for the parents and the children to say goodbye to each other, not knowing if they would ever see each other again, because most children who left through the kinder transport never did see their parents again. So at the time, my mother was 14, and my, uh, her brother, my uncle Werner, was 13. So at 14 and 13, they um, went to England, and uh, through this kinder transport program, there were sponsors who uh, sponsored them to go to boarding school in England. So they went to boarding school. They were there for the next three years, from 1939 to 1942. And while they were in boarding school, of course, their parents were back in Germany, still looking for a way out. And in my mother's diaries, she writes about, you know, the constant disappointment of getting letters from her parents saying, we tried to get a visa to this country, but it didn't work, and to this country, and of course, things in, in Europe are getting worse and worse. And, uh, you know, my mother was getting more and more frantic for, to find out if her parents would get out. Finally, um, my mother's parents managed to get a visa to Ecuador. My guess is that they probably bribed somebody at the Ecuadorian embassy. And this was in July 1940, so it was very late at this point. And actually amazing that they could still get out. So at the time, um, because at this point the Nazis had were all over Western Europe. So the only way my mother's parents could get out was across the Russian border. 
they uh, went to Moscow, sent my, uh, my mother and her brother a telegram saying that they had safely escaped Germany and were in Moscow. And my mother writes about that in the diary. <coughs> and then her parents took the Trans-Siberian Railroad from Moscow all the way across the Soviet Union to the Pacific end of the Soviet Union by Japan. And at the time, that journey took 10 days, the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad. So they went on a 10-day journey across the Soviet Union. And then they uh, went by boat from, uh, you know, by Japan to Hawaii, San Francisco, Panama, and finally Ecuador. Um, the ship stopped in Hawaii, San Francisco, but they weren't allowed to get off. The entire journey, I believe, from start to finish, three months. And after three months, they safely arrived in Ecuador. And then they spent the next two years trying to arrange passage for my mother and her brother from England. So finally, in 1942, my mother at this point, she was 18, and her brother, who was 16 or 17, uh, arranged passage on a freighter um, from England to Ecuador. So they crossed the Atlantic in a freighter cargo ship um, as part of a 30 ship convoy because the Atlantic Ocean was full of German submarines. So they had to travel as a convoy. I believe some of the ships in the convoy were attacked, but their ship was not. And they eventually um, docked in Buenos Aires, took a train across to the Pacific side of South America, and then a boat up the coast. And finally, in 1942, were reunited with their parents in Ecuador after three and a half years apart. And again, most of the children in the kinder transport never saw their parents again. So my mother and her brother and their family was very lucky to be reunited. But you can imagine the uh, culture shock after all of them having grown up in Germany in this very, um, like I said, kind of cultured middle class life, a lot of classical music and you know, very educated and all of that. And suddenly they were in a completely different culture in the jungles of Ecuador, not speaking the language. And you know, it obviously, you know, took a lot of getting used to. Um, but they lived in Ecuador uh, until the war ended in 45, so they lived there for three years. And during that time, my mother really uh, flourished. She started a kindergarten for English-speaking, it was an English-speaking kindergarten for children there. I imagine that it was mostly for children of German-Jewish refugees. There was a big, uh, big German-Jewish population of refugees who had escaped to Ecuador. And they had their own um, athletic games, and you know, my mother ran track, and you know, they had a whole life in Ecuador as part of this very robust German Jewish community. And um, then in 1945, when the war ended, well, first in, in 1944 on D Day, my mother's father died of a heart attack. So he's actually buried in Quito, Ecuador. I hope to visit there someday. And um, in 1945, after the war ended, my mother, her brother Werner, and their mother emigrated to New York. And um, they lived in the Washington Heights section of New York, which at the time was where all the German Jewish refugees lived. I remember visiting my, my grandmother on my father's side there, and there were just you know German Jewish bakeries and stores everywhere, and it, it was really a great place. And um, since it was a very tight-knit community, it turned out my mother's mother and my father's mother knew each other from back in Germany, and my mother's mother took my mother to visit Mrs. Steinberger one day. Mrs. Steinberger said, oh, your daughter's beautiful. Does she have a boyfriend? And, <laughs> <laughs> so the mothers actually fixed them up, and um, my mother married Ralph Steinberger, and uh, they lived a very happy life together. My mother died in 1996. My father died in 2002. And then, as I said, we found these diaries. My uncle Werner, well, I should say my uncle Werner, in the early 1950s, after Israel became a country, uh, emigrated to Israel. And he's been in Israel now for um, about 70 years, I believe. Um, and he had a very successful career, first as an Israeli diplomat and then in real estate. And today he's 96 and still doing well. He and his wife have 
four children, 12 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. <laughs> and I'm actually going to be traveling there in two weeks to visit everybody in Israel. So I'm looking forward to telling him about this. And um, so my uncle Werner um, was in New York in 2002 when we were cleaning up my parents' house, getting ready to sell. And just by coincidence, he came to the house in Queens um, and wanted to look and see if there were any mementos of sentimental value that he might want to keep. And we were going through a big tour of photo albums, and I came across these diaries, which I had seen before, but I really didn't know what they were and didn't appreciate them. And they're written in old-fashioned German, so I mean, I, I don't even read modern German, let alone old-fashioned German. So I would have had no idea what they were, but just as fate would have it, Werner happened to be there with me, and he saw them, and he immediately recognized what they were, and was just absolutely thrilled. And um, he took them back to Israel with him, had them transcribed in German, had them translated into English, and sent them to uh, colleagues and family members all over the world, including in their hometown of Bamberg. He, unlike many Jews, um, stayed in touch with people in Bamberg, had a very um, soft spot for it, and actually throughout his life made trips back there when any of his children or grandchildren had their bar or bat mitzvahs, he would take them back to Bamberg to show them where they came from. And so he was in touch with many people there. So the town of Bamberg was so thrilled by the discovery of my mother's diaries I always say she was kind of like the Anne Frank of Bamberg. And um, so the town of Bamberg did all kinds of exhibitions about the diary. Um, they had uh, girls from my mother's former school do public readings. And then they put together this book in German that has the contents of my mother's diary and pictures from the diary. Um, and it's used in uh, schools in Bamberg. And I'm not sure if it's used in other towns as well. Uh, it's used as a textbook to teach German children about the Holocaust because it's written in the voice of a teenage girl. So it's something that they can really identify with. And then my uncle also wrote a memoir of his own, which is gigantic. It's like a textbook itself. Um, and in the middle of the, this is all in English, and in the middle of, the, uh, of his memoir, he has a whole section devoted to my mother's diary with uh, most of the contents of the diary is here in English, along with a lot of pictures. And he's just done a, an amazing job of preserving the family story. It's called We Were Europeans because he wanted his children and grandchildren to know where they came from, even though they were all born in Israel. He wanted them to know that they were Europeans. And uh, this is a picture of, of Bamberg. You can see what a, you know, what a picturesque town it was. And so he really wanted them to know where they came from. In fact, it's uh, dedicated on the front page to his 12 grandchildren. Um, and so this book, We Were Europeans, by Werner Lovell, he changed his last name from Lovell to Lovell. Um, and it's available on Amazon. I mean, one of the amazing things about the diaries is that you'll be blown away by the handwriting. This mm -hmm. yeah. beautiful, tiny handwriting in this old-fashioned German. And the pictures. And yeah, again, my mother was a teenage girl at the time, so it's full of little pictures. And she actually got this first volume as a 13th birthday present from her grandmother. And um, at the time, this was before Kristall left, before things got bad. So the first year and a half or so of entries are just all about um, parties she went to and concerts and plays. and you know, her life at school, and it's the life of a typical teenager at the time. And then, of course, on Kristallnacht, everything changed. And one of the things that I think is very interesting is she never actually writes about Kristallnacht because she was worried that this would fall into the hands of the Nazis. So instead, she just posted here um, a poem by Roger Kipling called If. Mm. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It starts with the words, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you. And it goes on that way. And that is what she posted, or what she put in there on Kristallnacht, instead of actually saying anything about Kristallnacht. And then from there, of course, she goes on to talk about, um, you know, the kinder transport and their life at uh, boarding school in England and then the journey to Ecuador. And again, all kind of in the voice of a teenager.
So it really is very interesting. I'm hoping at some point to donate the original diaries to the U.S. Holocaust Museum. They had at one point expressed interest in it. They have a big collection of Holocaust diaries. But I haven't been able emotionally to part with them. But I think probably they should be kept, you know, in the right conditions and where researchers can use them. So um, that's my long-term goal. I did read the, uh, your mother's diaries in, in that book. And what I found amazing is she always had such a positive attitude. Yeah, yeah. It was never really complaints or desperation. Yeah. And, and there much she was very positive through the whole thing. And her brother is the same way, also very positive. Thank you. Thank you.